Oh hell internet, this video is really long, apologies for that in advance, and I hope you don't mind me sitting down. I'll explain more in a moment. Last year I looked at The Crisis in Education, which is the fifth essay from Hannah Arendt's Between Past and Future. The sixth essay is called The Crisis in Culture, and it's an essay I didn't really follow when I first read it, but after looking at The Crisis in Education, I started it again, and it's still extremely complicated, but this video is the result of that plunge back into it. The length of this second video should be considered a mark of my ignorance rather than confidence. As I always say, I'm no academic and I do not speak German. Uh, but I hope this gives the viewer something to reflect on. Uh, and even at this length, I promise I have not covered all that there is in this essay. If you think I've missed the mark on anything, as always, let me know in the comments. In some ways, the crisis in culture is a companion piece to the crisis in education. And this was probably intentional by Arendt, but if we look at the titles of the essays, there is this pattern emerging. There's a clear pairing of the third and fourth essays and then the fifth and sixth essays by their naming convention, and this naturally divides the book into four parts. It is still one book though, and all of the essays deal with the problem that is raised in the preface, the gap between past and future, a gap which is causing us particular issues as we enter the modern age. The crisis in education specifically removed education from the political realm, but the crisis in culture actually talks about how our experience as human individuals interacts with that exact realm, the political one. Therefore, it's a much more complex piece, even though it's only slightly longer. Also, Arendt is tying together things which don't always seem as closely related as she wants to make them. I'm still not sure she's entirely successful, or maybe I have missed something, but the essay certainly does highlight what could rightly be called a crisis in culture leading into the modern age, and something that is reflected in many things we see in modern discourse. One thing I also think is certain, where the crisis in education was a fairly self-contained piece, the crisis in culture needs to be discussed in the context of Arendt's then emergent idea of the Vita Activa, which she expanded on in her later work The Human Condition. And just to be clear, I have not read The Human Condition, it's on the list, okay? But I have read about it, and so anything I say here should be considered a derivation from other authors, most notably the extensive article in the Stanford Online Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The Vita Activa is a life that takes action, which is a technical term Arendt uses for creating new forms in some way, especially in the public space. The Vita Activa has three aspects. Labour, which is the way that we sustain the needs of biological life. Work, which is how we manufacture the artifacts of the world beyond simple subsistence. And then action, which is the way that humanity expresses its plurality of individuals. Action is the greatest expression of the Vita Activa because it is how we, as agents, actualize the only freedom we can really be said to have. And in doing so, we affirm our responsibility for the human world by our ability and willingness to disclose our authentic selves. The Vita Activa is partnered with the Vita Contemplativa, a distinction that was inherited from the Greeks as Arendt inherited so many other things. As I wrote this piece, I tried to put the Vita Activa and Contemplativa into schematic form. And to be clear, this is my form for my benefit, but it is the map of concepts that I will be referring to as I go through this essay. You will probably have a different perspective on the Vita Activa, and of course this is completely consistent with Arendt's idea of personal discourse. Closure. A few things. First of all, I want to explicitly acknowledge that I'm a Westerner commenting on a Western philosopher whose personal focus was the Western tradition. This is absolutely fine, of course, but I feel it needs saying up front. I will also be referencing my own personal Eastern philosophical influences uh, from a Western perspective, but if you think of culture in a different way, I would love to hear about it, especially if you come from a different traditional background. Also, Arendt uses biological sounding terms like animal laborans or homo faber. I've also used these and similar terms as rhetorical signs, but I want to be clear if it happens to be necessary that despite the nomenclature, I'm using these as philosophical and not biological terms, and more on that later. 
And finally, be warned, Arendt was actually philosophically committed to using the male gender pronoun for certain purposes. I won't go into that here, but I have quoted her verbatim. For my own part, I try to make an effort to use inclusive language where I can, especially when looking forward to the future, but I may have slipped up in places. Then, this is a video essay, and it really is an essay. I'm sorry, I'm not really accomplished at bringing in entertaining aspects, and there will be a few rhetorical flourishes. On the other hand, if you're here at this point, I think you're on board enough with the ideas that you won't mind if maybe it's a little bit dry. But sorry about that. I will start at the beginning, but fair warning, this will not be a linear path through the essay. Arendt notes that in recent years, talk has emerged, rather snobbishly at first, of mass society or mass culture as some kind of degraded or debased form of society and culture. Arendt asks first whether this poor appraisal is deserved, and then whether this new mass society and mass culture, if they are a thing, have the same relationship that society and culture did before them. In answering this, she says first that it's the emergence of modern art through the 19th century that really highlights the rebellion of an artist against society, which she saw as existing at that time. But she says that this was long before anything considered like mass society had ever come into being, and so complaints of the depravity of mass society are unwarranted. Next, she states what mass society is in her view. Mass society clearly comes about when the mass of the population has become incorporated into society. This statement, I think, shows that Arendt and I interpret the word society slightly differently, and this will be a recurring aspect throughout the essay, which is due to our different experiences, locations in time, and of course, possibly my own misunderstanding. Arendt describes society as something relatively new in the world, essentially equating it with good society or genteel society, which is those parts of the population which dispose not only of wealth, but of leisure time, that is, of time devoted to culture. For my part, I would define society as something that emerges when surplus production enables a whole population to experience, and also some part of that population to devote themselves to, the production of auxiliary artifacts. In plain English, when there is enough left over for leisure time, humans will experiment with leisure activities. By essentially saying that all humans are part of some kind of society, I appear to be using a slightly broader definition of Arendt, who seems to believe that good society really didn't exist until the Renaissance. Good society, as we know it from the 18th and 19th centuries, probably had its origin in the European courts of the Age of Absolutism, especially in court society of Louis XIV, who knew so well how to reduce French nobility to political insignificance by the simple means of gathering them at Versailles, transforming them into courtiers, and making them entertain one another through the intrigues, cabals, and endless gossip which this perpetual party inevitably engendered. As true as this political statement might be, it doesn't follow that this is the beginning of society, and honestly this doesn't seem plausible given the complexity of many earlier civilizations, including the Romans, who Arendt will go on to take her own definition of culture from. All of these civilizations must have had their own version of the chattering classes, and we can even speculate about the proto-society and proto-culture of hunter-gatherers, who also had significant amount of free time. Despite my difference of perspective here, Arendt does have a good reason for limiting the scope of good or genteel society. Let's see how she describes the transition into mass society. The mass of the population has been so far liberated from the burden of physically exhausting labour that it too has the time for culture. Hence, mass society and mass culture are interrelated, but their common denominator is not the mass, but rather the society into which the masses have been incorporated. Again, I'm not entirely comfortable with the implication that the masses have been historically excluded from society and culture, but I will take Arendt at face value. Mass society is good society. It just so happens that the masses have now gained access to this pre-existing realm. 
To be fair to Arendt, there's no value judgment explicit in this. This is just how she sets up the emerging conflict, and she characterizes the rise of social sciences in the 20th century as simply the exploration of the modern individual and the inevitable conflict that will arise between that individual and society. As is their role, the artist was the harbinger of this conflict and remains at the heart of it, as we will see. But today, we must all grapple with the nature of our individuality in a mass context, which is the problem that Arendt diagnoses. As long as society itself was restricted to certain classes of the population, the individual's chances for survival against its pressures were rather good. They lay in the coexisting non-society strata of the population into which the individual could escape. And one reason why these individuals so frequently ended by joining revolutionary parties was that they discovered in those who were not admitted to society certain traits of humanity which had become extinct in society. Arendt's dense prose aside, I would like to ask her what these new desirable traits of humanity were previously part of, if not society. But Arendt is forthright in her perspective that this external space is found in the well-known glorification of the workers and the proletarians, but also more subtly in the role assigned to hayas or to wows, that is, to groups which society had never quite absorbed. The phrasing of that quote, and others, is rife for bad faith interpretation. So let's just assume that Arendt, herself a wa, although not an aya, is not making any value judgments at this stage. She's simply rendering the tapestry of culture as she sees it. This assumption is obviously neither wholly true or wholly false, but let us recognize that Arendt is essentially saying that this external space and its various inhabitants are truly the wellspring of artistic inspiration that feeds fresh dynamism into the river of society and helps to renew it. On the other hand, yes, it is easy to see how, in talking about assigned roles to sections of the population deemed other, Arendt appears to be walking a very dangerous line. However, I contend that she is walking not to mark a border, but to explore an unknown landscape. And thus, perhaps the line was an illusion all along. And yes, I am quite proud of that rhetorical flourish, but I do not deny that there is more to discuss there. However Arendt actually sees the part of the world that lies outside society, she regards the emergence of mass society as having tragic consequences because a good part of the despair of individuals under the conditions of mass society is due to the fact that these avenues of escape are now closed because society has incorporated all strata of the population. As such, Arendt identifies the artist as the last bastion of individualism within mass society, the creators that must somehow make their own liminal space against society's external pressure. But Arendt is not interested in the artist as an individual, but as the wellspring mentioned above, the creator of culture, and she's interested in what the rebellion of the artist means for mass society. But first, although we have alluded to it, we need to confirm what culture is, and for that, we need to jump ahead a little bit. It's in part two that Arendt clarifies her position on culture, and she says that the phenomenon of art should be our starting point. However, while culture and art are closely interrelated, they are not the same thing. The distinction between them is relevant for the problem of what culture is and in what relationship it stands to the political realm. Arendt, characteristically, returns to the root of the Western philosophical tradition, and I almost feel like this section is an exercise in comparative mythology rather than political theory, and I will explain that later. The word culture derives from the Latin colere, which means to cultivate, to dwell, to tend or preserve, and it relates to cultivating and tending nature until it becomes fit for human habitation. As such, it indicates an attitude of loving care and stands in sharp contrast to all efforts to subject nature to the domination of man. 
So the Latin word for culture is literally derived from that for agriculture, even though on first glance it might appear to be the other way round. Arendt cites Cicero as first linking this to a wider social context with a term like cultura anima, the cultured mind, which would be used in much the same way as it might be today. Arendt will ultimately make this term a linchpin concept in her position. But she also draws a distinction between this gentle husbanding of what is natural and a traumatic violence violation caused by manufacturing. This relates back to the Vita Activa, which divides the labour of animal laborans, raising a subsistence living, from the work of Homo Faber, manufacturing artefacts for a world. Side note, but it is an odd choice to choose the term animal laborans over, say, Homo laborans, and thus dehumanise those in the realm of labour. Arendt could reasonably say this is because the vital life process is something we absolutely do share with all animals, but to use the Linnaeum nomenclature in this way is optically unfortunate. A change to Homo laborans seems to me to be of no great consequence, and I think it more clearly defines the human world, so I will choose to overrule Arendt in this case. The following passages are a briar patch of historical comparisons, and I will render as best I can what I think Arendt is saying, but I claim no authority. The Romans saw culture as the raising up of something and the preserving of it as a world. This process was naturalistic, similar to raising a child, something I think we can all agree should never be thought of as manufacturing. In fact, she says this is the opposite process. Manufacturing out of components requires a violation of the natural world to force it into the forms that mankind has decided on. This also draws a stark contrast between the Roman perspective and the Greek. While the Romans tended to regard even art as a kind of agriculture, of cultivating nature, the Greeks tended to consider even agriculture as part and parcel of fabrication. The Greeks did not know what culture is because they did not cultivate nature, but rather tore from the womb of the earth the fruits which the gods had hidden from men. Arendt notes that even the cultura animi is suggestive of something like taste or sensitivity to beauty, not in the artists themselves, but in the spectators. This is the first time we see a reference to beauty, which will come up more later on. But taking from this, Arendt defines culture as being the mode of intercourse prescribed by civilizations towards the least useful and most worldly of things, the works of artists, poets, musicians, philosophers, and so forth. These works of art, the fabrications of the fabricators, are the least useful of things because they're created without any practical purpose in mind, and they are the most worldly of things because, despite that, they are still created, and they are able to endure through time even beyond the lifespan of their creators despite having no utility. Culture is the interaction that the population have with these artefacts only after they have entered the world, i.e. after the fabrication has completed. Despite saying the Greeks did not know what culture is, Arendt goes on to hypothesize about what Greek culture consists of by using this quote from Pericles. She quotes this from Crawley as being, Athenians cultivate refinement without extravagance and knowledge without effeminacy. Arendt typically uses more words in her translation, but I would note this is with the purpose of isolating terms. Sometimes verbosity is necessary. We Athenians love beauty within the limits of political judgment, and we philosophize without the barbarian vice of effeminacy. Even so, I feel like Arendt may have gone a little too far in introducing detail into this quote. She focuses on the words malachia and eutalia, and she calls them strictly political, the latter being the virtue of a man who knows how to act, and the former being the vice of barbarians. What kind of vice, we ask? Well, in decoding the quote, Arendt says, we are told that it is the realm of politics which sets limits to the love of wisdom and beauty. And since we know that the Greeks thought it was the polis and politics and not superior art which distinguished them from the barbarians, we must conclude that this difference is a cultural difference, a different attitude towards beauty and wisdom which could be properly loved only within the limits set by the polis. 
Effeminacy is thus a kind of cultural incapability, caused by the sad misfortune of having been born outside a polis. It's an inability to exercise judgment at the appropriate time and in the appropriate way. However, it's also identified as one of the dangers of philosophy, which even though it's supposed to enhance our wisdom, if it's applied beyond its politically expedient limits, can actually become unwise and lead to inaction. This leads Arendt to her next round of questions, but I want to butt in there for just a moment. Obviously, I am not a scholar of Arendt's stature, so take this as an appeal from my own ignorance, but the only references I can find to the word eutalia describe it as cheapness or even worthlessness. The most positive interpretation is Crawley's without extravagance, which does not equate exactly to accuracy of aim. It could mean utilitarian, which would line up with Arendt's position, thinking of it as stripped down to the very bare essentials. But there I will end in speculation, and I'll leave it as an exercise in ancient Greek for the viewer. I presume Arendt has taken her own interpretation from a considerable knowledge of Greek literature. However, this is related to what I said above. This feels more like comparative mythology now. Clearly, the nature of this language is not allegorical in the way that mythology is, but I think it's also clear that Arendt is making some quite broad brush interpretations over historical trends. This is fine, and the etymological roots she's laid down do make sense, but they also imply some assumptions, like, for example, the assumption of Greek cultural superiority. And the implied metaphor of culture as some great tree-like entity, raised lovingly and organically out of the soil of evolutionary history, I think it crosses the line from analogy into allegory. Oh, and as for effeminacy? Look, taking it also as softness or delicateness, it shows that it can be an appropriate word for some abstraction in that time given extant stereotypes. We can understand what it's intended to mean. Arendt has further given it a specific political definition which further abstracts it. I'm going to assume that this word can represent that definition without bias. If you disagree, then please give your perspectives in the comments. Now that we know what society and culture are, Arendt asks why the rebellion of the artist is important in observing the cultural crisis. The artist produces the artifacts of culture and yet still somehow remains an outsider. And so, the charge that the artist lays against society is summed up in one word, Philistinism, a mentality which judges everything in terms of immediate usefulness and material values, and hence has no regard for such useless objects as culture and art. Skipping over where the term actually came from, the basic form of Philistinism consists in simply being uncultured. But Arendt observes that over time it evolved as the emergent middle classes tried to increase their standing against the aristocracy, and thus cultural artifacts began to be transformed into a social currency. This further demonstrates Arendt's view on society. Culture began to play an enormous role as one of the weapons to advance oneself socially and to educate oneself out of the lower regions where supposedly reality was located, up into the higher non-real regions where beauty and the spirit supposedly were at home. Arendt is clearly invoking an analogy with the Platonic realm, and in the context of the Vita Activa, she makes society that realm where we can find beauty. This is where the new rich wish to gain access in an uphill struggle with the aristocracy and their contempt for the sheer vulgarity of money-making. And yet this realm is somehow cast as being not real, in contrast to Plato who thought that the realm of ideas was more real. I wonder if both can be true somehow. This alludes to some counterintuitive relationships in Arendt's position. Society is not reality, and being in that space is somehow destructive to things that are real. This explains why the artist is likely to rebel against their patrons in the new rich. They smelled the danger of being expelled from reality into a sphere of refined talk where what they did would lose all meaning. A society so polite that during the Irish potato famine it would merely say, that root. This anecdote contains, as in a nutshell, the definition of the cultured Philistine. Also counterintuitive is the way that Arendt describes self-education, a way of refining oneself or self-perfecting as a means to escaping reality into the rarefied spiritual realm. 
This sounds kind of nice, but she clearly casts it as a pejorative. This is because this process of self-perfection robs cultural artifacts of their deeper purpose by reducing them to something utilitarian, as shown in the following two quotes. It may be as useful and legitimate to look at a painting to perfect one's knowledge of history as it is useful and legitimate to use it to hide a hole in the wall. In both instances, the art object has been used for ulterior purposes, i.e. as a means. The point of the matter is that, as soon as the immortal works of the past become the object of social and individual refinement and the status accorded to it, they lose their most important and elemental quality, which is to grasp and move the reader or spectator over centuries. So it's the items which outlast their creators which define our past, and the appropriate relationship to these exact objects are the culture of a population. What is appropriate? We'll come back to that later. The creators of those artifacts take inspiration from reality, which is the lower realm where the artist is more comfortable. But inevitably, because art transcends the life process, the artifacts are transferred into the higher realm, which is where culture resides. Those who come from reality, the new rich, have found a new currency in cultural objects as a means to access the higher realm, and the artists themselves rebel both against this apparently cynical commodification, but also against the disdain of the cultural elite. We see more of this in part two, where Arendt describes the Greek equivalent of this Philistinism. Despite having claimed that the Greeks did not have culture, before going on to hypothesize about the nature of Greek culture, Arendt now says that the Greeks, and not the Romans, did have a word for Philistinism. The word is banassos, and it also means mechanical or artisan, as well as unworthy or vulgar. Here again we can see the association of the artists with the realm of fabricators, of work, and also the way that they are often, for that very reason, viewed with contempt and suspicion by society. Philistinism was considered to be a vice most likely to occur in those who had mastered some techne or skill. The chief reason of the distrust of fabrication in all its forms is that it is utilitarian by its very nature. Fabrication, but not action or speech, always involves means and ends. In fact, the category of means and ends derives its legitimacy from the sphere of making and fabricating, where a clear goal always drives the process. This crystallizes yet another friction point between the artist and society. When doing work, the fabricator can only think in terms of means and ends, and the moment this point of view is generalized to realms other than fabrication, it will produce the bonosic mentality. Arendt says that this mentality is a threat to everything in the higher realm. It even threatens the political by demanding or assuming some goal or end is implied by any political action. It threatens the cultural because, as we saw above, cultural objects lose their essence when they are treated as ends or to create value. But this seems remarkable because the artists themselves are the creators of the work, and they are themselves fabricators, but Arendt is explicit. The greatest threat to the existence of the finished work arises precisely from the mentality which brought it into being. As someone with Taoist leanings, there is a pleasing allusion here to the presence of a singularity, a point of contradiction which creates turbulence, but where all is done without doing. I will say more on this below, but there is only so far we can go in this assertion that the mentality of artists threatens art, and not everyone will express this in exactly the same way. I think Arendt recognizes that she is speaking generically about a very dynamic system, and the broad dangers she's identified of the Banasic mentality manifest in very diverse ways across the world. Turning her attention to the modern world, Arendt says that we are more inclined to see Philistinism as a trait imbued by the cynicism of political life itself, that maybe action itself leads to Philistinism. But she says that this is wrong, and misses the fact that the mentality of fabrication has invaded the political realm to such an extent that we take it for granted that action is determined by the category of means and ends. But this is in fact already a harmful effect of the Banasic mentality spreading into the public space.
And this exposes the conflict between the artist and society. Although Homo Faber, and who knows, maybe even Homo Laborans, can drive the wellspring of culture in a meaningful way, the actual artists who represent that change will find themselves ill-suited to the realm to which they carry their message. This leads Arendt to another point of contradiction. In order to be in a position to constantly add new things to an already existing world, the artist must be isolated from the public. Truly political activities, on the other hand, cannot be performed at all without the presence of others. This fundamental disconnect is the source of a mutual distrust between the artist and society, and this distrust often boils over into outright hostility. At this point, the conflict between art and politics arises, and this conflict cannot and must not be solved. Arendt is saying that not only is the conflict between art and politics inevitable, but it's also an integral part of the process of world renewal. With all of that said, let us now consider the 20th century and mass society. Hi. As I said, I can't be the only one who's found this essay difficult to contextualize, and I have chosen an odd path through it for this video. So before we move on to the real meat of the essay, let me just say where I think we are at this point. We've looked at Arendt's definitions of society and culture, and I think she's also identified an axis that leads up through the Vita Activa from the reality of Homo laborans via the technical mastery of Homo Faber to the refined realm of society, wherein the public space and culture reside, curated by, let's call them Homo Cultura, the people of action. The artist represents this journey, and their activities are either pushed or possibly pulled up into the public space. What also happens is that people of work and labour, seeking quite reasonably to reach the sphere of action, start to trade on their knowledge of culture and, seeing it as a means of self-education, employ the techniques of Homo Faber to accrue influence. This is the denigration of culture known as Philistinism or the Bonosic mentality. This denigration of culture occurs when the cultural artifacts lose the faculty of arresting our attention and moving us. This faculty is our first allusion to what I have called that which ties back, the idea that something links culture back to its naturalistic namesake without the violating intermediary of fabrication. I feel like I see more action in the realms of work and labour than Arendt has presented here. Surely all people experience a public space, even if it is not THE public space, and so all people get to disclose their authentic selves. This muddies the waters of the theory somewhat, but as I said above, Arendt also expands on all of this in the human condition. That said, in Between Past and Future, I think Arendt does occasionally demonstrate a platonic elitist streak? The idea that those who succeed but are outside society may be violating cultural objects by daring to do anything so base as educate themselves? Honestly, it seems almost caste-like in its mentality, but I am from a different time. And this is not Arendt's final word on these issues. No doubt she had her biases, and I do not know against whom these might have been. Her language is often quite condemning, but always against types of behaviour and never groups of people. If we were to dig into her extremely interesting life, then we should no doubt find greater context for all of this, but we will not be doing that here. We now move on to the period which Arendt sees as bringing mass society and culture, the 20th century. In case anyone was wondering, I have no expertise on the development of art into the 20th century, I will therefore give three quotes that seem to best sum up Arendt's cultural case, and then try to comment on them from my position of not only relative, but objective ignorance. We all know the deplorable art products which educated Philistinism inspired and fed on. It was the kitsch of the 19th century. The astounding recovery of art in our own century, and a less apparent but no less real appreciation of the greatness of the past, began when genteel society lost its monopolizing grip on culture, together with its dominant position in the population as a whole. Arendt says that this recovery is a moment of retaliation against the Philistinic disintegration of culture. 
In this disintegration, culture, even more than other realities, had become value, i.e. social commodity which could be circulated and cashed in in exchange for all kinds of other values, social and individual. The end of the whole process came with the bargain sale of values during the 20s and 30s in Germany and the 40s and 50s in France, when cultural and moral values were sold out altogether. I do not know what Arendt means by the bargain sale of values, nor exactly which values she feels were sold out. It sounds like it's all of them, but in these three quotes she seems to be saying that the social and political realignments of the post-Renaissance era changed the structures of cultural dominance within Western society, and this allowed fresh energy to well up from reality into society and the public space. This energy was then co-opted both by the cultural philistine and the proper cultural critic and then transformed into different things. And this is a separate phenomenon to that of the bonosic mentality invading the societal space. Now, to be clear, the way I just put it is an educated Philistine's way of putting it. In reality, these movements were like the shifting of Earth's plates and came at the cost of a great deal of upheaval and destruction along with the creation of something new. Unfortunately though, the bonosic mentality persisted and the cultural disintegration continued. This is where Arendt really introduces the word value, and she's implying that it's possible to draw a direct link between all the different definitions of the word. She seems quite cavalier about it too, but I would like to query whether we can make this move of saying that value, the abstract noun meaning worth, has a direct relationship to value, the specific noun meaning a principle, and then all of the various uses of it as a verb, she values them, it is valued at, and so on. Taking a leaf out of Arendt's playbook, I looked at the origin of value. It's from the Latin valere, to be worth, but its roots go back to some Proto-Italic and Indo-European words meaning to rule or be strong. So it does seem, and I'm sure Arendt was aware, that there is an early connection with a political concept. If we turn to the Greek, then there are numbers of words that have been used to include the broad concepts of worth, utility, but also rightness and moral virtue and community spirit. For the record, I did not look into all of these words, but I think that Woodhouse seems to have nailed the top two entries, axia and time. And should it need saying that I am not a scholar of the ancient Greek either? Apart from that though, is it fair to derive our modern meaning of words from dead languages? Maybe the meanings have diverged over time. It does happen. So let's just consider if we can use a principle, say, such as the sanctity of life, and treat it as a source of value in the same way that currency is. As we do this, let's also consider if this is exactly the kind of bonosic error that Arendt is charging Homo Faber with, the mistake I made above when I called the French Revolution a social realignment. In thinking about taking this step, are we in fact becoming Homo Faber and violating some part of the natural order? Well, let's take the step. Yes, I think we can go from value as in principle to value as in worth. One 21st century example is the phenomenon of virtue signaling, the cynical expression of a virtue for the purpose of social credit rather than genuine engagement. It gets called out online and some are no doubt guilty and some are no doubt innocent, but the accusation targets a calculus that unscrupulous people have been using for centuries. That person holds value X. Lots of people disagree with value X. I can construct a disagreement with that person. If I construct a disagreement with that person, then those people who disagree with value X will agree with me. And in having a large group of people agree with me, I can, via the right mechanisms, accrue social and thus material power or resource from the existence of value X. And if we want to take that last step to the sanctity of life, we simply need add, that person's life has less value to me than the resource or influence I stand to gain from their death in the war against value X. And if it makes you uncomfortable to hear that in the first person, then imagine how it feels to actually say it. So yes, maybe this is what Arendt means when she says that the bonosic mentality is harmful to culture. But from this cultural position, Arendt is typically pragmatic. One may see in the bargain sale of values the melancholy end of the Western tradition, but it is still an open question whether it is more difficult to discover the great authors of the past without the help of any tradition than it is to rescue them from the rubbish of educated Philistinism. <sighs> Savage.
The task of preserving the past without any help of tradition, and often against traditional standards and interpretations, is the same for all of Western civilization. The thread of tradition is broken, and we must discover the past for ourselves, read its authors as though nobody had ever read them before. In this task, mass society is much less in our way than good and educated society. Let's take a moment to recover from Arendt's absolutely biting prose and ask her how mass society could be the lesser obstacle. It is because society wanted culture. It evaluated and devaluated cultural things into social commodities, used and abused them for its own selfish purposes, but it did not consume them. They disintegrated until they looked like a heap of rubble, but they did not disappear. Mass society, on the contrary, wants not culture, but entertainment and the wares offered by the entertainment industry are indeed consumed by society just like any other consumer goods. This distinction is what drives society towards the realm of homo laborans. These products serve a biological life process, not literal sustenance, but the filling up of vacant time, a hiatus in the biologically conditioned cycle of labour. I'm sceptical of how far she can take this analogy, and she does take it pretty far. Entertainment, like labour and sleep, is irrevocably part of the life process. Biological life is always a metabolism feeding on things by devouring them. But if entertainment, that which fills vacant time, is inherently part of the life process, then anything is inherently part of the life process, it seems to me, since the life process directs itself towards forms of greater complexity. So there is no issue of society being drawn into the life process. It already is. This seems to be part of my ongoing difference of perspective with Arendt, but ignoring that, there is an observable connection between the demand for certain kinds of entertainment and the demand for the ongoing sustenance of food. As Arendt puts it, Bread and circuses truly belong together. Both must be constantly produced and offered anew. The standards by which both should be judged are freshness and novelty, and the extent to which we use these standards today to judge cultural and artistic objects, i.e. objects that are supposed to remain in the world after we have left it, indicates the extent to which the need for entertainment has begun to threaten the outside world. Arendt is keen to suggest that mass society is not the instigator of the cultural decay, and as such may still prove to be the lesser threat to educated good society. However, entertainment, and more particularly the entertainment industry, does pose its own kind of threat to culture. The entertainment industry is confronted with gargantuan appetites, and it must constantly offer new commodities. In this predicament, it ransacks the entire range of the past and present culture in the hope of finding suitable material. This material, moreover, cannot be offered as it is. It must be altered in order to become entertaining. It must be prepared to be easily consumed. Arendt now leads directly into her definition of mass culture. Mass culture comes into being when mass society seizes upon cultural objects, and its danger is that the life process of society, like all biological processes, insatiably draws everything available into the cycle of its metabolism. The danger of mass culture is that what should endure cultural artefacts are drawn into a biological process. But biological processes are the realm of homo laborans, and bread and circuses are the society of the masses. So mass culture becomes a vortex that chews through the public space and shreds the cultural artefacts that it finds, but they are not utterly destroyed. The result of this is not disintegration, but decay, promoted by intellectuals, often well-read and well-informed, whose sole function is to organise, disseminate and change cultural objects in order to persuade the masses that Hamlet can be as entertaining as My Fair Lady, and perhaps educational too. Whatever is the greater threat to culture, it certainly seems to be under threat from multiple directions, with little clear concept of a way out of this dark forest. I guess that's why it's called a crisis. A few pages later, though, Arendt sums up. The trouble with pre-modern society was that its members, even when released from life's biological necessities, could not free themselves from concerns of the individual, for example, status or personal neurosis. These individual concerns are what eventually pulled Philistines towards the commodification of culture. 
The relatively new trouble with mass society is perhaps even more serious, but not because of the masses themselves, but because this society is essentially a consumer's society, where leisure time is no longer used for self-perfection or acquisition of more social status, but for more and more consumption of more and more entertainment. It's difficult to be sure which situation Arendt has more disdain for from her tone, but she does broadly seem to have concluded that mass society is, in fact, more damaging to culture than good society. The outcome of the mass transition is that good society was greatly expanded as ever more humans found themselves with more leisure time, which, especially in the case of Homo laborans, is likely to be engaged in the passive consumption of entertainment, and this is part of the life process. But the core issue began in good society, when the cultural Philistines commodified cultural artifacts. This was, of course, the fault of Homo Faber, whose Bonosic mentality began the process of cultural denigration that accelerated as the life process grew in hunger. The danger was ignored by the haughty Homo cultura until it was too late. The result is not mass culture, which, strictly speaking, does not exist, but mass entertainment, feeding on the cultural artifacts of the world. OK, I've made Arendt's position a little bit more melodramatic in the telling, but you have to admit that last line fit in pretty well. I think I've ended up at a slightly different position, although it's always possible that there's more nuance in Arendt's position than I've read here. I don't think the tripartite vita activa is three discrete levels, but rather an interpenetration of the three. It must be in some way, or else how would the life process be able to transition between realms in the way that she describes? But this means that there is hope for the universality of action to be able to develop throughout the polity and truly allow humanity to be happy and fulfilled when all humans become philosophers. A hope which Arendt dashes with her very next line. To believe that such a society will become more cultured as time goes on and education has done its work is, I think, a fatal mistake. A consumer society cannot possibly take care of a world. Consumption spells ruin to everything it touches. <sighs> well, I can dream, can't I? Again, we could reflect more on this, but let's go back to culture and how it becomes associated with the political. Having examined society and culture and their mass counterparts, we are now led to ask, why is it harmful if cultural artifacts are used in this way? Arendt has been emphatic, maybe even a touch hyperbolic, about the way the appropriation of cultural artifacts for entertainment debases them in some way and prevents them from being that conduit back to the essence of reality. Could we even say they lose their function? As you can see, I tend to disagree on this point, but I think that comes from a difference of temporal perspective. And this will be the discussion of the final part, but why is she so clear on this? An object is cultural to the extent that it can endure. Its durability is the very opposite of functionality, which is the quality which makes it disappear by being used and used up. I'm not sure that durability is the opposite of functionality, but let's pass over that. Arendt is suggesting that art is made to endure, and the idea that it should have a function is a modern fabrication. Even those functions of doing art to express oneself, or viewing it to reflect on oneself, or even having it expressly produced to embody some societal message. With respect to cathedrals, she says, Cathedrals were built for the glory of God. While as buildings they certainly serve the needs of the community, their elaborate beauty can never be explained by these needs, which could have been served as well by any nondescript building. Their beauty transcended all needs and made them last through the centuries. But while beauty transcended needs, it never transcends the world. On the contrary, it is the very beauty of religious art which transforms otherworldly contents into tangible worldly realities. In this sense, all art is secular. Arendt concludes by saying that the true source of the religious impulse may be either in the beyond of the hereafter or in the deepest recesses of the human heart, indicating an admission that modern secular explanations can be just as effective as traditional ones. That said, I would say that the elaborate beauty of a cathedral has many prior functional explanations. Every cathedral that was built throughout the medieval period was commissioned by some individual or group with some political goal in mind. Well, 
most of them perhaps. The elaborateness of the decor and the grandness of the architecture is absolutely a part of that goal, and this would have been conveyed to the artisans, either explicitly or implicitly. These cathedrals were the work of the Masons, one of the first middle-class professions because of the wealth of intuitive engineering and physics they were able to achieve with just simple tools. Their craft was, of course, employed towards the glory of God, but it was also employed in competition, both political and professional, and the same with those who carved the gargoyles and every other lavish detail. The finished product was then a masterpiece of aesthetics and engineering, and thus it had the effect of arresting the attention of all those who saw it. And because it was a cathedral in a Christian land, it also performed the function of transitioning that attention towards the glory of the Christian God, a political entity. Once again, Arendt would, I think, accuse me of the Banasic mentality, and maybe rightly. In her mind, the thing which transcends culture and links up to that which ties back is the pure, unadulterated beauty. That is what made them last through the centuries. Arendt notes that of all the things that are part of the human world, consumer goods are transitory by definition. Tools and use objects are inevitably subject to being worn out over time and repeated use. Even noble action, the expression of our unique plurality as humans, exists only briefly without people to record and recall it. Thus, from the viewpoint of sheer durability, artworks clearly are superior to all other things, since they stay longer in the world than anything else. They are the worldliest of all things. This notion of a world is one that Arendt refers to often. Humans began in hunter-gatherer subsistence living, but eventually we did enough fabrication for that to begin to change. This earthly home becomes a world in the proper sense only when the totality of fabricated things can resist the consuming life process of the people dwelling in it and thus outlast them. Only where such survival is assured do we speak of culture, and only where things exist independent of all utilitarian references do we speak of works of art. Let us take the nomadic peoples of Mongolia and their charming yurts. Somewhere back in the mists of time, these yurts were primitive shelters made from simple components easily destroyed by a season or two of family use. At a certain point, the first yurts were made that were robust enough for parents to meaningfully say that they passed the same yurt on to their children. This now constitutes a world. Whether Arendt would say that nomadic Mongolians could create a culture is uncertain. Any one family tradition could be wiped out by a fairly small disaster. But I think she would be clear that they do not create works of art, because the nomadic lifestyle would be loath to keep any Thing that exists with no function at all. The most worldly things last longest, and in the case of artworks, this is caused by their beauty. It's not based on resilience, the Mona Lisa could be destroyed in a moment, it's literally based on their having an unambiguous link to the highest expression of the beautiful. This, says Arendt, is why any discussion of culture should begin with art, and it alludes to the fact that culture is influenced not only by art, but by politics, in spite of the friction that exists between the artist and what Arendt calls men of action. In fact, that friction simply does not exist at all between the public space and the cultural artifacts themselves, because both public action and culture must necessarily be part of the public space. Both action and art lose their meaning if they're not publicly seen and experienced. Thus, art must be protected from the possessiveness of individuals. Given that an increasing number of artworks end up in private collections in free ports where they do not incur tax bills, we can see how well this is going, and how the Banasic mentality has, in Arendt's view, invaded the mindset of even those in the public space. Assuming that cultural openness actually happens, however, how we choose to interact with the artifacts is also a part of the culture, and this method is determined by the political realm. It does not matter whether this protection takes the form of cultural artifacts being set up in holy places, in temples or churches, or placed in the care of museums and keepers of monuments, although the place where we put them is characteristic of our culture, that is, of the mode of our intercourse with them. The facility to have any kind of cultural access can only be created and consolidated by the political action of individuals, creating this interdependence. 
Generally speaking, culture indicates that the public realm, which is rendered politically secure by men of action, offers its space to display those things whose essence it is to appear and to be beautiful. In other words, culture indicates that art and politics, their conflicts and tensions notwithstanding, are interrelated and even mutually dependent. And beauty, in return, provides the durability that allows action to persist through time. Seen against the background of political experiences and of activities which, if left to themselves, come and go without leaving any trace in the world, beauty is the very manifestation of imperishability. The fleeting greatness of word and deed can endure in the world to the extent that beauty is bestowed upon it. Without the beauty, that is, the radiant glory in which potential immortality is made manifest in the human world, all human life would be futile and no greatness could endure. So it is that artworks join politics as part of the public realm, and the proper relationship to them therefore has the potential to somehow bridge the gap between the artist and the public figure. The common element connecting art and politics is that they are both phenomena of the public world. What mediates the conflict between the artist and the man of action is the cultura animi, that is, a mind so trained and cultivated that it can be trusted to tend and take care of a world of appearances whose criterion is beauty. And the way that the cultura animi does this is what takes Arendt to her final destination in the crisis in culture. We're almost there. <laughs> I want to take a moment to explain the schematic of the Vita Activa as I see it. If you're still watching, then thank you, and you might have a different view on this schematic, or your mind might be suggesting something else. Let me know. But anyway, first of all, the Vita Contemplativa is shown, along with a few vague concepts that I've just thrown in there. This is all pure speculation, and that is all we'll say of the Vita Contemplativa, although there are some components of it on the left-hand side, which I believe are connected to it in some way. I will also not really speak much of natality, save to say that it relates to bringing into the world of newness, and thus I place it outside the world initially. As we said, the Vita Activa is divided by Arendt into labor, sustaining a life, work, developing a world, and action, diversifying a polis. The inhabitants of the first two realms are Homo laborans and Homo faber. I don't know if Homo cultura is a good Latin, but this is the term I will put in for the realm of action. I have seen the term Homo politicus used, but this would seem to exclude the artistic aspect of culture. I'm sure that we all are, every one of us, at some time Homo laborans, at others Homo faber, and maybe just occasionally we make it to be Homo cultura. I don't know how a rent would respond to that assertion. I have added an extra region that sits over labor and extends up into the realm of work labeled cultivation. This is where agriculture occurs and all of the other things that sustain the biological life process, including such entertainment as is required to fill the vacant time when one is not working. This is a contained region labeled bread and circuses, after a reference of juvenile which Arendt mentions. This is a place where entertainment has evolved under the auspices of fabrication. We've technically already covered bread under agriculture, I guess, so perhaps this region would be better named Cake and Circuses. Beginning in the realm of action now and extending down into the realm of work is society, or what Arendt might call good society. Those people who have been more or less cut off from the pressure of subsistence need, and within society we find the public space, wherein culture finds refuge and its curators engage in the discourse that they believe will best preserve the beauty of the cultural artifacts. It seems to me that society must naturally extend into the upper regions of the realm of work because the boundary between the two is so diffuse. But, says Arendt, cultural philistinism extends this region over time. Artworks and the results of political speech exist within the public space, but the process of art, the verb form, is what the artist brings up from reality. I have tentatively referred to its political counterpart as rhetoric, as that skill drives reality into political society. Either way though, cultural philistinism converts both into value, which Arendt says covers all meanings of the word. 
And so I wonder, must we also bite the bullet here that on the border between work and action and no hire is where our moral values also reside? But if we don't fall into the bonosic trap here in our response to art and culture, then we can use taste or judgment respectively, although Arendt doesn't necessarily distinguish between the two. The result of taste and judgment applied to art and politics is culture, which is the highest point of a civilization. It's what connects to the beautiful. And now let's see how we can get back down to the realm of reality. As I see Arendt's position, mass society occurs when society is pulled or pushed into the life process and the great mass of humanity starts to consume entertainment that pretends to nobler things than mere reality. Mass culture occurs when the great cultural artifacts of a population are dragged down by fabrication and also pulled into the life process. It seems that Arendt believes that both of these processes are somewhat parasitic, feeding on the higher realms and draining them of their essence. Arendt is clear that this is a negative impact on the progression of culture. I am not so sure. Okay, we are almost there, but this is the longest section of all. We're going to return to the term Arendt introduced earlier from Cicero, the cultura animi. This is the mindset that allows a person to stand back from their personal perspective and simply observe what is going on. To fully bring out how this relates art to culture and culture to politics, Arendt turns to Kant. Beginning with the celebrated categorical imperative, she gives the classical statement of this moral code, always act in such a way that the principle of your actions could become a general law. The classic example is lying. Lying can never become a general law because if everyone lied, there would be no trust in the world and so lying would not be effective. Therefore, you should not lie. The categorical imperative thus puts the transgressor in the situation of contradicting themselves, which is presumed to be something that no rational human would consciously do. Arendt cites this principle of self-agreement as the core tenet of Socrates. It is better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. Or as Arendt poetically quotes from the Gorgias, since I am one, it is better for me to disagree with the whole world than to be in disagreement with myself. Yet this principle of self-agreement cannot give us a true political model because it isolates the dialogue to within the individual. The answer, says Arendt, is in fact found within the first part of Kant's critique of judgment in discussing the aesthetic sense. In the critique of judgment, Kant insisted on a different way of thinking for which it would not be enough to be in agreement with oneself, but consisted in being able to think in place of everybody else. The process of reasoning requires a dialogue with myself, but the process of judging requires an anticipated communication with others with whom I know I must come to some agreement. From this potential agreement, judgment derives its specific validity. In essence, the more we are able to detach ourselves from all of the personal needs and biases that we have, the better we are able to assume the state of mind that allows us to exercise true judgment. I understand the term specific validity to mean something like validity based on the sum of informed perspectives, and Arendt's following discussion of taste and the cultura animi essentially expands on the definition of what an informed perspective is in this context. And of course, says Arendt, this ability was known to antiquity. The Greeks called this ability thronesis or insight, and they considered it the principal virtue of the statesman in distinction from the wisdom of the philosopher. Ultimately, the difference between judgment and rational thought is a link to common sense. Now, I will admit to some surprise that Arendt uses such a vague term, and I had an involuntary reaction of disdain against it, but naturally, she has a specific definition in mind. Common sense discloses to us the nature of the world insofar as it is a common world, that our strictly private and subjective five senses can adjust themselves to an objective world that we all have in common. She goes on to say that judgment may be the most important aspect of the quality of sharing the world with others. Is this what Arendt would later go on to describe as plurality? The inherent nature of the fact that it is men, not man, that live upon the earth? 
With this view of common sense in mind, we can see that it remains a nebulous and ever-changing concept, but at least we could now frame it as some aggregate quantity of judgment within a polis. Thus, we have a framework for objectivity in matters of judgment. We want to believe our common sense is good, and this creates an incentive in everyone to expect agreement from everyone else. To the extent that Arendt's common sense is coherent, this enables a real model of the public realm, which people should follow. The activity of taste decides how this world, independent of its utility and our vital interest in it, is to look and sound. But judgments, whether of politics or taste, are not like other types of action which can be compelled by violence or reason. They must persuade a person to agree, actively encouraging them to accept the model of events that the artist or politician is seeking to project. This is why I've used the term rhetoric as the political equivalent of art. Although it is true that Arendt does not use the term in this essay, you may decide this is incorrect. Either way, however, this brings art and politics into harmony. Artistic culture and politics, then, belong together because it is not knowledge or truth which is at stake, but rather judgment and decision, the judicious exchange of opinion about the sphere of public life and the common world and the action to be taken. This conclusion that taste and judgment is not only objective, but also the chief cultural activity among man's political abilities, is so surprising that Arendt brings in another aspect to support it, and that is in the experience of friendship. We all, says Arendt, know how it feels to immediately strike a rapport with a person we have just met, how we find their company to our taste, so to speak. From the point of view of this common experience, it is as if taste decides not only how the world is to look, but who belongs in it. There are several concerning implications to this assertion. One, that this leads us to some kind of elitist conclusion, or a situation that might makes right, or a tragic inevitability that some of our relationships will end in mutual disgust. All of these outcomes are possible, but Arendt takes a more nuanced human view. Wherever people judge the things of the world that are common to them, there is more implied in their judgments than simply those things. By his manner of judging, the person discloses to an extent also himself, what kind of person he is, and this disclosure, which is involuntary, gains in validity to the degree that it has liberated itself from merely individual experience. Again, Arendt wishes to find in the political arena some standard that has at least a chance of being, if not universal, at least acceptable to the plurality of mankind, while still respecting that the individual retains the right to disclose themselves. Disclosure is another activity that will be developed further in her later work. We disclose our authentic selves when we take action in the public space. This action is irreversible and unpredictable, and we do not often retain control of the narrative that is applied to it. This is why forgiveness becomes an important, although sadly unembraced, part of the public space, a phenomenon that Arendt would get to witness herself just a few years later, in the controversy surrounding the trial of Eichmann and the banality of evil. Our ability to disclose ourselves in this way is what demonstrates that in the public space of actions and speech, it is who we are rather than what we know that is most important. And it seems that this is true even if what we know is relevant, because our actions in the public realm are a matter of judgment and taste, simply, which as we have previously seen is different from rationality. Is that what describes the effectiveness of rhetoric? This is concerning because rhetoric, as we know, can birth an unambiguously awful progeny, demagoguery. Despite these risks, we are kind of stuck with judgment and taste because the qualities and quantities of the fabricated world do not apply here. In this respect, the political realm is again opposed to the domain in which the artist and fabricator live and do their work, and in which it is quality that counts. Quality is beyond dispute. It is no less compellingly evident than truth, and stands beyond the decisions of judgment, beyond the need of persuasion and wooing agreement, although there are times of cultural decay when only a few are left who are still receptive to the self-evidence of quality. Taste as the activity of a truly cultured mind, the cultura animi, comes into play only where quality consciousness is widely disseminated, the truly beautiful easily recognized, for taste discriminates among qualities. 
I'm a bit concerned with Arendt's terminology here, although of course I could be missing something. She begins the quote talking about the quality of fabrications and, as with several other words we've seen, there is some ambiguity as to whether this refers to the adjective form, the standard of one's work, or the noun form, the traits of the object. And there's some ambiguity about whether this matters as well. It does seem that the noun form would include Lockean secondary qualities, which are certainly not objectively agreed upon. I also wonder if Arendt may be begging a question. If there are times of cultural decay when the truly beautiful cannot easily be recognized, then taste is not applicable. But isn't correctly recognizing the beautiful part of what taste is for? Isn't the self-evidence of quality simply that? It seems as though Arendt is saying taste comes into play only in situations when taste can come into play. Well, gee thanks, but why can't taste come into play during times of cultural decay? On the other hand, it is possible that all Arendt means in this quote is that the expression of true taste presupposes a stable world, with a public space in which judgments can be made. Regardless of that, Arendt relates back to the earlier discussion of Greek culture and the accuracy of taste, saying, taste sets its own limits to an indiscriminate, immoderate love of the merely beautiful. Into the realm of fabrication and quality, it introduces the personal factor, that is, gives it a humanistic meaning. Taste debarbarizes the world of the beautiful by not being overwhelmed by it. And this is how Arendt comes to conclude the essay with the humanistic purpose of the cultura animi. Returning to the Romans, she intends to show how taste is the political capacity that truly humanizes the beautiful and creates a culture. She draws a direct contrast between the common Roman adage and Cicero's apparently rather rebellious response. The first quote says that Plato is a friend, but truth is a better friend. And Cicero responds, I prefer to be wrong with Plato than to be right with his opponents, which happened to be the Pythagoreans in this case. Arendt claims that the former quote was uncomfortable in some way to the Roman sense of humanitas, the integrity of the person as a person. She makes some linguistic interpretations which I am unqualified to judge. I would say that it's all Greek to me, except it's actually Latin. And she concludes to say it is fair to translate Cicero as saying, it is a matter of taste to prefer Plato's company, even if this should lead us astray from the truth. What Cicero in fact says is that for the true humanist, neither the verities of the scientist, nor the truth of the philosopher, nor the beauty of the artist can be absolutes. The humanist, because he is not a specialist, exerts a faculty of judgment and taste which is beyond the coercion which each speciality imposes upon us. This Roman humanitas applied to men who were free in every respect, for whom the question of freedom, of not being coerced, was the decisive one even in philosophy, even in science, even in the arts. Cicero says, in what concerns my association with men and things, I refuse to be coerced, even by truth, even by beauty. Some almost liturgical repetition in that quote. And now it's a bit of an extravagance, but let us read in full the final paragraph of the essay. This humanism is the result of the cultura animi, of an attitude that knows how to take care and preserve and admire the things of the world. As such, it has the task of arbitrating and mediating between the purely political and the purely fabricating activities, which are opposed to each other in many ways. As humanists, we can rise above these conflicts between the statesman and the artist, as we can rise in freedom above the specialities which we all must learn and pursue. We can rise above specialization and philistinism of all sorts to the extent that we learn how to exercise our taste freely. Then we shall know how to reply to those who so frequently tell us that Plato or some other great author of the past has been superseded. We shall be able to understand, even if all criticism of Plato is right, Plato may still be better company than his critics. At any rate, we may remember what the Romans, the first people who took culture seriously the way we do, thought a cultivated person ought to be. One who knows how to choose his company among men, among things, among thoughts, in the present as well as in the past. 
Arendt has drawn an engaging and attractive conclusion that in the process of becoming truly cultured and learning how to express our taste in an authentic way, we can also achieve the implicit goal of any civilization to lift up the individuals that constitute it as the true embodiment of humanism. What she's not done is to show that humanism is the only possible method of achieving a culture. And of course, her model of society and culture is a judgment and not a derived certainty. Her choice to tie every Everything back to the Greeks and Romans is a noble one, and it reflects her conviction that even if traditions fail, the past is still a valid source of direction. However, she seems almost to cling to that, and does not fully consider that the mass societal shift might have changed the nature of the whole game in a way that fundamentally changes our relationship to the past. One thing I do see in Arendt's final conclusion is a nod to why she became such a devotee of the cult of the United States. Okay, sure, cult is a little bit tongue-in-cheek there, but... <clears throat> the cultura animi is the only way to express freedom, which is interpreted as a lack of coercion. This is just dripping with the kind of rugged individualism which has driven US culture since its inception. The ruggedness of the individualism, which I interpret as lacking in nuance, seems to be a matter of Arendtian common sense to US citizens, and this is why libertarian freedom is much more popular there as an idea. Arendt was well acquainted with Nietzsche, and this all sounds like the kind of apotheosis of the individual that he envisioned, somewhat recklessly we now think. However, I should say that Arendt has a more mature and careful approach here than someone like Nietzsche or Ayn Rand, although she can't help but get a little elitist here and there. And yes, I see elitism as one of the dangers of delineating the world into realms in this way, however you choose to do it. But on the other hand, some delineation is always necessary, so maybe a little elitism comes along with that. I don't know. The whole volume of Between Past and Future is unnervingly prescient, although some of that is undoubtedly projection on the part of our own judgments, fitting our own interpretations of history onto an Arendtian or Nietzschean frame. I will do this very briefly because essentially every issue could be looked at in this way, and that could be its own video, or a series of videos. Hannah Arendt died suddenly in 1975, leaving her philosophical work incomplete. Four years later was released perhaps the first work of mass entertainment to transcend the model she is describing. George Lucas' Star Wars became a phenomenon in its own right and began what might be called the first unambiguous work of mass culture. Some people identified with and organized their lives by the principles of Star Wars to the extent that Jedi was actually recognized as a religion in the UK census, for a time at least. Now, on the one hand, it is true that Jedi principles are themselves derived from a patchwork of Eastern philosophies, and so one could argue that this makes them an example of exactly the cultural decay that Arendt describes. And beyond that, Star Wars has since been acquired by Disney, and much of the output has become more cynically commodified, driven more by a bonosic calculus than cultural elevation. And yet, Star Wars will outlive George Lucas. It will outlive everyone who saw it at release. It retains neither freshness nor novelty, and yet it will continue to speak to some portion of the population. And so by Arendt's own standard, it is not mere entertainment. Interestingly, the very first Star Wars film was produced with input from Lucas' friend, Joseph Campbell, a comparative mythologist and the popularizer of the hero's journey in fiction. The hero's journey can be reduced to a motif of just three words, separation, initiation, and return. Viewed in Arendtian terms, this motif can reflect culture. Cultural objects arrest our attention, the separation. They move us internally in a way that we do not fully control, the initiation. But this experience is not one that we can maintain for long, and we must be brought back within the confines of our human experience, perhaps with new insight, the return. Star Wars is just one of the developments that Arendt may have commented on in the nearly 50 years since her death, and many of these have gone on to mean something special to many, many people. And there are many more cultural works that will go on to mean something special to just one or two people. These works will not really outlive their fans, but for those few fans, the experience will be literally life-changing. But to wrap up here, I would like to go to the biggest personal thing that influences, or biases, my interpretation of Arendt, and that is my
I spoke above about my Taoist leanings, and if I were to give myself a faith, then it would be secular Taoism. I play up the word faith there partly because of my obvious personal neurosis about the term, but also because many people who actually have a faith will not recognize what I describe. Taoism is a theory of forms that hypothesizes the existence of a natural way that emerges out of all the interactions that all possible dualities in existence can express. This is called the Tao, and to the extent that we can understand anything about it at all, humans determine their own way by measuring existence, first with our mere sensations, and then with the various tools we've been able to construct. Measurement, whether it is done with perfect or imperfect information, implies a continuum of possible values upon which we measure, and a continuum implies the existence of a duality at the two extremes. Our current credo of process today is called scientific method, and that is the process in which I put my faith. But it is an incomplete process. It yields ever more precise, but probably never quite conclusive results on the absolute nature of reality, although many other sufficiently conclusive results can be obtained along the way. To the extent that I am secular, this is what I believe, so why do I choose the Taoist angle to add to that? Very simply, because I want to acknowledge the role of religion, and Taoism, to me, is the most reductive form of metaphysical framework that fits with all, yes all, world religions, and hypothetically could fit into any metaphysical framework experienced by life as we know it. And this connection is mediated through the ideas of yin and yang. Taoism is not the only Chinese system that touches upon the ideas of yin and yang. It's not even the first, but it has become associated with it, not least by me in my westernized experience of Eastern cultural artifacts. Yin and yang are the ultimate expressions of the supreme duality. They characterize every possible duality, but one very core interpretation is surrender and control. Yin and Yang also interpenetrate each other, so although Yin is generally interpreted as passive and Yang as active, there is dynamism in every system. In the realm of politics, the Tao Te Ching repeatedly reiterates that the Yin path is preferable, weapons are only to be used in defense, and all should be done without doing. How might this be reflected in the crisis in culture? As I've created my own schematic of the crisis in culture, this faith has been biasing my perspective in various ways. Some of these biases have been reflected in conscious choices. For example, I suspected a reason to move the blue arrow from politics to the middle before it became associated in my mind with mass culture. Others will have been entirely subconscious. The result, though, is something which represents what I can only call cultural churn, whereby forms bubble up from objective reality through the realm of fabrication where they are subject to the control of agents, to express themselves on the surface of the public space, where all things express their true nature in a way which is also, although perhaps not quite as clearly, objective. That which ties back is what every world religion and personal creed has sought to do since time immemorial, resolve the highest aspects of our culture with the humbling experience of the life process that has given birth to it, and to do it in a way which feels natural, a way that you can surrender to, which works passively and does not require any tiresome fabrication. This is the true purpose of the Cultura Anime, to take an attitude to the world that can embody that which ties back, the beautiful. And this also explains the tension that exists between the Cultura Anime and the fabricators who are the primary executors of control in the world. Seen in this way, the realm of fabrication is the point of maximum amplitude from the great unity, but it's also an expression of that unity subjected to control. Fabrication is the furthest one can be from that which ties back, and yet, without fabrication, it's not possible to pass from the realm of the life process into the realm of action. Without fabrication, there would be nothing to be tied back. Hence, yin and yang emerge as interpenetrating aspects, opposites that cannot and should 
should not escape each other, just like art and society, public space and the mass of homo laborans, the cultura anime and philistinism. And perhaps we should be cautious not to vilify philistinism too harshly, because it is the other end of the cultural churn, sucking cultural artifacts back down to the life process to be iterated anew for a new age. Arendt might be appalled at this because of the apparent destruction of the past, and I do think that the knowledge of what the past once meant is an important thing to record. But all forms must pass, and ultimately they do. Better may be that cultural artifacts be returned to the bosom of the life process, and the degradation they may be subjected to is just the reflection of the discomfort of their creators. OK, yes, that all got a little melodramatic at the end there, but don't worry that I'm going all woo-woo on you here. Secular Taoism rests on the idea that, to the extent that science or its legitimate successors have answered a question, then that is the extent to which we have a model of yin and yang in the human world. Beyond that, we must use our best judgment. What does it all mean? That is me asking, by the way. I don't have an answer for you, I'm sorry. But after this thrilling adventure through the crisis in culture, and I do say that without irony, what have I to report? Well, I think the best thing I can do, and this will probably serve as the summary to this video as well, is to start with a glossary of terms. If you followed Arendt's arguments in The Crisis in Culture, you probably have a network in your head comprised of these terms, which may or may not match the definitions I give below. Of course, it goes without saying that one-line definitions lack nuance, and if you think I've grievously misunderstood Arendt, then you should let me know. Anyway, in a roughly helpful order. Good society, the section of a population which is able to devote the bulk of its time to the appreciation of cultural artifacts and engaging in the public space. Mass society, occurs when society has expanded to all strata of the population, leaving no external space of escape and rejuvenation. The public space. Although everyone in good society is separated from the life process, they are not all involved in taking action and taking responsibility for the political state of the world. Those that do are taking their actions in the public space. The life process. This is an abstracted version of the biological need of life to pursue its goals of subsistence, reproduction, and, says Arendt, the filling of vacant time. This occurs on whatever scale we wish to discuss, from the single cell to the entire biosphere or beyond. The life process technically does not use fabrication, but it seems as though a competitive model of life, such as a Darwinian one, would imply the development of an arms race. The world. The human world is an aggregate of all of humankind's fabrications. It gains in durability as it is further and further removed from the life process, until it is possible for artifacts to be created that have no function at all but to express the world's nature. Art. The objects that express the world's nature, they are inherently beautiful because of how they reflect the world in a natural way. These are the least useful and most worldly of things humans create, and they are the things that we call art. Philistinism, or the Bonosic mentality. The mindset and behaviours derived from treating all things as a means towards ends, an excessively utilitarian outlook. The Bonosic mentality prevents us from seeing the true meaning of beauty and thus denigrates our humanity. Culture, the summation of, and properly decided relationship to, the least useful and most worldly artefacts of a population. Mass culture occurs when mass society begins to develop entertainment for the masses from cultural artifacts. This leads to the degradation of the artifact's connection to the beautiful. Beauty. In case you didn't notice, Arendt doesn't really define beauty in the crisis in culture, although it is literally the fixed point from which the whole cultural edifice hangs. However, thanks to the idea of common sense, culture itself can point to the beautiful in an objective way. Hmm. Beauty is related to the organic processes of the Romans, but beautiful art cannot come into being without fabrication. Bonus word, sublime. This is not really mentioned in the crisis in culture, but the sublime is a counterpart of beauty, according to Kant, being those things which move us in a different way, inciting feelings of awe or even terror. This can also be affected by the things we've been discussing. 
effeminacy, an inability to engage with the beautiful or sublime with moderation, leading to a lack of discipline in behavior and judgment. Cultura animi, a cultured mind, a state of being able to properly interpret the state of culture, either politically or artistically, or both, so that one may make judgments that are most likely to accord with the aggregate perspective of the population. Enlarge mentality, from Kant, an ability to conduct one's thought process in the virtual presence of other agents with whom one must eventually reach an agreement. This enlargement takes place along an axis of inclusivity, and the further along that axis you are, the more specific validity your thoughts gain. Specific validity, a judicial analogue of logical validity derived from an extended application of the enlarged mentality. Plurality. Plurality is the experience of living in and perceiving a shared world. This is something that Arendt considers in greater detail in the human condition. Common sense. A vague idea of the shared world that is common to all members. It consists in the hypothetical, ideally enlarged mentality. This is more precise than an everyday idea of it's just common sense, but it still seems highly impractical as anything other than a rhetorical concept. Judgment, the form of decision making that occurs via an enlarged mentality. Although it appears to be subjective, Arendt says that it claims its specific validity from common sense, which as noted is somewhat ephemeral. Taste, a subset of judgments concerned with aesthetic matters. Arendt treats the two as more or less the same thing in different domains. My schematic places them almost in opposition, but they can still be viewed as a single phenomenon. Disclosure, the expression of one's true self through the medium of action in the public space. As Arendt will later explore, the ability to disclose ourselves is our most fundamental political nature as humans, but it is an irreversible process over which we have limited control. Humanism. Humanism is the mode of interaction that a person will have with the world through the cultura anime. Like I say, let me know how you think my definitions stack up with yours in the comments section below. Arendt was, sadly, ultimately pessimistic about the state of mass society and mass culture, seeing it as destructive to true culture and the reverence for the past. She did not seem to believe that any version of the cultura anime could penetrate widely into the lower realms because of its constant consumption. Even worse, as more and more people consider themselves to be cultured, and fewer and fewer truly are, this will lead to a proliferation of effeminacy within a culture, a vice which can then be demonstrated in diverse ways by both sexes when they become overwhelmed by what they see in the world. Despite her careful language and obvious wish to appreciate the huge changes of the modern world, Arendt's position does wind up implying a certain conservatism of culture, a conservatism that I think is no longer possible, and this leads me to my final word. In my ruminations on modern life, I am constantly brought back to a metaphor that I suspect Arendt would not appreciate, and that is that humanity is skydiving into the future. Insofar as we are equipped for a skydive, that equipment has come from the past, but it exists in a different paradigm now. So let me suggest a suitably contradictory maxim for where we go from here. Mass culture is individual culture. The past is where cultural heritage comes from, and we all need to learn that and respect that, which is the purpose of education. But we also need to learn and respect that others have sincerely held beliefs that come from very different places. And I'm not just talking about across the world here. In the mass age, it's inevitable that different people respond to radically different sets of cultural artifacts, cultural sets that are being created anew all of the time and revised in real time. This complexity and diversity will only grow over time, can only grow over time, to fulfill the life process's urge not only to consume, but to seek novelty. In the mass age then, the system has moved much further towards an extreme where every individual has an entirely different set of cultural artifacts that they respond to. It will never get to that extreme of course, we are still social creatures of habit, but the result of such vast populations and technological advancements is that when you meet a person, it is far better to believe that you have really nothing in common at all. 
But along with that, and this is where it gets harder for us, you should extend that assumption to every other person with whom you obviously have nothing in common. And the bit that we are really bad at is that if we're going to experience outrage on account of something that happens way across the world, which we do, then we are bound, on pain of hypocrisy, something I know we are all keen to avoid, to extend the same human attitude across the world regardless of all groups and boundaries. If everything can count as happening in our backyard, then everything can count as happening in our backyard. And isn't it strange, or is it, that most people who listen to the last few sentences will say, well, duh, and strongly believe that they are generally good at that, including myself, even though the evidence says that the vast majority of humans are generally bad at that. Isn't it strange, or is it?